we will have, please hold your questions, we'll have Q&A uh, from participants in uh, the last 10 minutes. So we know our uh, keynote speaker, uh, Thomas, very well. So I will begin by introducing uh, our moderator and uh, fellow panelists. So our, our speaker uh, will be joining the panel. We have moderator and fellow uh, panelists. So I will begin by introducing our moderator, uh, Adriano Garcis. Adriano has 15 years of experience in healthcare and medical device sectors, expertise in evidence generation, business transformation, market access, and commercialization of digital product, uh, products, directs programs for top pharma and medical device companies focusing on clinical evidence and validation of digital health products, experience in pre-market FDA submission for software as a medical device uh, globally, holds biotech engineering degree. Oh, lost, we lost our feed. Do it. Okay. Is it the project? Uh, there we go. All right, we're back. Okay, we left you hanging there. Where are we at? Okay, biotech engineering degree. I'll try to see if I can get this uh, right. Universidade, Universidade uh, Lusovana, Portugal. Uh, MBA from uh, Bentley, right here in Mass. Advanced studies in public health and IT leadership at the Harvard School of Public Health. Ves uh, Vesper Ramos, MD, Medical Director of Global Medical Affairs at Pfizer Hospital Products and Sterile in uh, Injectables, Leader in Diverse Therapeutic Areas Across Pharma Value Chain, Experience in Neuroscience, R&D, and Internal Medicine Clinical Development, Medical Director of Global Medical Affairs, Pfizer Hospital Products and Sterile Injectables, Leads Hospital at Home Alternative Sites of Care Initiatives, former FDA Medical Officer in Devices and Associate Investigator at the NIH. Panelist Bhaskar Dutta, PhD. Bhaskar holds uh, has 20 years of experience in data science, digital health, AI, and drug discovery. Led Data science and AI teams in academia, digital health, and pharma sectors. Holds MS and PhD in engineering with focus on data science applications in biology and medicine. Has published in top journals such as Nature Communication, Science Signaling, Cancer Cell, Oncogene, Nature Scientific Data, and Cell Systems. Frequent speaker at conferences on data science and AI. Adriano? Okay, thank you so much. Um, so delighted for the invitation. Thank you, David, Fionn, and the AKT Health. Thank you for the panelists for being here today. Thank you, Thomas, for uh, uh, taking us through a, a journey in uh, AI use cases and, and applications. Um, I would just start to uh, you know welcome everybody here. Uh, thank you for taking some some of your time today in the evening. Uh, to be with you uh, with us uh, here today. So Adriana Garcia, as you already uh, had our uh, overview of, and, and background, but uh, uh, just an, uh, additional uh, information about where I come from and the company I work for. So I work for ZS Associates, uh, that is a uh, global healthcare services firm, uh, 14,000 employees uh, with global representation in 38 uh, locations uh, globally. Uh, and uh, we support pharma, health tech, and med tech from discovery to commercial. Uh, I lead the site based prospective evidence generation group that helps uh, 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 executives like our esteemed panelists with understanding the types of evidence that they need to validate their products. Uh, to find where the right patients are, what are the right sites to run research, 
what is the right uh, compliance uh, uh, IT infrastructure to collect clinical trial data, and then what are the right AI models to analyze data and to publish those results. So, uh, thank you, uh, thank you everyone. So I'll open it up to, to the panel. And uh, Thomas, you, you walk us through a plethora of, of use cases. Uh, definitely more focused on uh, helping out with that uh, uh, workflow language, uh, creating clinical language for uh, uh, professionals uh, uh, delivering care, uh, saving time, uh, helping making, uh, uh, making better decisions. Um, I was going to turn it to any of the panelists here. Uh, Oscar has uh, more an experience and background on digital health, digital innovation, uh, and also medical affairs uh, technology, Vesper on the medical affairs side. From all the things that Thomas talked about, uh, what are the uh, use cases or uh, some of use cases that Thomas might have referred or other use cases that are more meaningful to your own respective areas that you feel that hold it most promise? Do you want to open? So a uh, little bit just to add, um, before going into the answer, just to add a little bit of context of where I work in Project 2, because that will have the decisions of the answer. So I lead a uh, digital health and medical research technologies group at Alexson Pharmaceuticals, which is a rare disease arm of AstraZeneca. Now, to understand, you know, how what promised the examples that we've heard today could be applicable in the medical affairs, let's think about what does medical affairs do. So what we do is we get involved in providing medical product with certain tool. And then we are responsible, the medical affairs in general is responsible for firstly understanding how this product is updated in, in the real world, what are the challenges and also to communicate with the physicians and care providers to uh, get reimbursement and if needed to run additional studies, some of which could be digital. Now, AI could be incorporated at every step that is important. AI could help in understanding how we collect insights, to we collect insights from all these disparate types of data, some of which are internal data sets that we generate ourselves and our external data sets. Center analysis and social media, could be publications. Each of these will have different volume, different signal to noise ratio, and a different level of confidentiality. Now, then we, based on the insight that we generate, we could find strategies. But what kind of strategy do we generate? One could be that how do we communicate our message better? What that means is we have to create content for the physicians and for the external community. And AI and genetic AI especially can help a lot in there. It can help as we go into multiple markets in medical affairs. We need a lot of translations. Genetic AI can help the translations. Uh, what else can we do? We can design and execute digital uh, you know, health studies. We are in the VCT panel, so of course we have to mention the VCT aspect as well. So genetic AI can help at various things. Helping protocols of writing, it can help in data analysis, it can help in creating decisions, so on and so forth. It can also help in having, we talked about interactive chatbots um, in the previous session. So it can even have, uh, it can help with the patient facing chatbots. It can have maybe physician facing chatbot uh, to have you know, this communication streamlined and standardized and accessible. So I'll probably pause there. There are like 100 other examples that you can. Yeah, so I viewed hospitals, um, or Tamasha's presentation with the view of hospital at home, which I lead at Pfizer, and Tomash pointed out first the digital inequities that exist. So AI is being touted as an important tool in making sure we're breaking down healthcare barriers, but at the same time, if funding gets diverted to more hospital at home and high-tech touch initiatives, 
and that could or potentially defund the more traditional means of providing service or it makes it less it makes healthcare less accessible for people who are not as digital savvy. So I really appreciate that you calling that out. And for hospital at home, I think you showed a slide where um, most of the FDA approvals were in the realm of cardiovascular. So Mayo Clinic, for example, now who is a leader in hospital at home, they have set up a command center where any patient who walks into their ERs with heart failure as a potential diagnosis gets immediately screened automatically with a preset um, set of criteria and automatic triggering for nurses and social workers to talk to the patient coming into the ER and say, you know, you might be appropriate for, for a hospital at home type of situation. So this is where I can see that AI is really critical to being able to operationalize healthcare trends that we think will impact. And then as Bhaskar said, of course, the biggest thing is data. You know, that's what AI can bring. It can help us get the insights that we need that we're not getting from subjective responses. You mentioned quite a bit about um, ambient AI also. So that's also something that's very controversial, but in, in good hands can get us really meaningful insights. So almost anything to add? I, I have actually a follow-up question. Um, well, the end of AI is an interesting thing, just, just a sidebar here, that you know, potentially in the future, you know, occasionally the patients have to fill some sort of a form, right? But in the future, they could just be you know, observed by AI. Then, then, uh, but could you tell us, or I'm also an interested personally, what if the um, hospital at home, um, how does it differ from a sort of outpatient? Could, could you tell us? Yeah, so hospital at home is providing acute level care in alternative sites. So these, this isn't home infusion centers, this isn't home hospice. It's providing acute level care. So patients who would fulfill inpatient criteria would be treated in their homes rather than in the traditional brick and mortar hospital. And the idea would be that, you know, this would address hospital bed shortages, for example, and also allow specialty care that's in sparse areas around the country or in other global areas, you know, to allow patients more access to that type of specialist expertise. Because as you also pointed out, there is going to be a shortage of healthcare professionals. Very just um... Very interesting, thank you. I do have, you know, I, I heard that, and I don't, I don't know enough about medical affairs, but I heard that, you know, there are trends around hyper-personalization, especially when you target providers. Um, do you see that in, you know, like campaigns or outreach, trying to, like, fine-tune or hone in on specific uh, requirements, specific trends? So, um, we, as medical affairs, we have been medical affairs organization talks to physicians and physicians are who so they have different preferences different priorities different beliefs and definitely if the messages can be tailored for the uh, individuals then there is high chance of having that up so but of course everything has to be done in a compliant way and we write governments and products now there are a lot of activities and, and kind of excitement around omnichannel engagement uh, and how do we because just like you know, any other human physicians engage through different modalities right so they hear something in conferences they see something in tv then they then an msl will approach them then something will pop up on linkedin so how can we have a more integrative, cohesive strategy to engage? First, to understand how to engage with someone in a most effective way, and then how do we engage with that person? Uh, so there is a lot of uh, activities going on uh, around pharmaceutical uh, companies. Um, that, that's curious. You you bring that up. Um, we have uh, two clients that I, I, I can disclose: the large pharma that are developing. Uh, their own AI agents 
to further uh, uh, do deeper analysis on the uh, clinical trial results, on the uh, published literature, on the social media, what are people saying about the products, uh, what are HTP saying about, about the products, uh, and what are patients saying about the product, and uh, creating that agent to further extract new value propositions from the product to create stronger rationales on why the HCP should prescribe or recommend that product to the patient, why the patient is better off uh, consuming a determined product versus the competition. So, and, and this involves large data sets, right? It's, it's not an easy task, it's not just chat GPT, it's licensing data, it's working with proprietary data, uh, and to generate all this uh, new rationale and, and value stories that then are converted in, uh, uh, in content that the, uh, the reps can start using to articulate the product in a different way to, to the consumer. Yeah, a big remit of medical affairs is really understanding and identifying unmet medical needs and care gaps. And I'm sure you guys can all understand and appreciate how if you have access to data, proprietary or not, you know, there's tremendous insight that you won't be able to get just by simply asking patients or physicians. And, you know, this is the other big unit of, of med affairs, which is real world evidence um, to see how our products are being used in the real world. I actually add uh, another. Uh, uh, were we going to add something? Um, wanted to change gears a little bit and go back to his uh, question about um, the uh, uh, inequality of access or ruling out patients because now we are introducing new layers of technology and uh, they are not uh, potentially not that savvy to uh, utilize these new technologies or absorb the outputs uh, of, of those technologies. Um, but a, a little bit of, of, of story here of where uh, we've seen in the past uh, five years more patients having access to research that they otherwise didn't have to if we didn't uh, use AI technology, for instance, to identify those patients in a more refined way. We are finding patients um, because now we know we have more data about their characteristics we are able to run sensitivity analysis on the inclusion and exclusion criteria at the phase of developing those protocols so we can simulate protocol one, two, three, four and establish the likelihood of finding the sample size that we need to be statistically significant to you know, prove out or to answer those research questions. The, um, and then the, the, the other aspect is that we normally don't talk about, and it ties to that clinical leverage and workflow leverage, is um, uh, sometimes the level in the protocols is not on the choice of the endpoints or inclusion and exclusion criteria, the schedule and assessments. It's extremely burdensome um, to collect all that extra uh, data and run all those extra assessments that go outside of routine clinical practice. And sometimes, I'm sorry, pharmaceutical firms uh, are kind of uh, a little bit of insensitive when uh, they think they have the best protocol, then they go to the site and they say, no, no, you have to deliver it as is. Um, not allowing for a lot of back and forth and redesign with, with the sites uh, to um, uh, turn that protocol into something that they can actually deliver. So AI is, uh, is, is helping uh, to simulate all those scenarios, to have better conversations with science, and opening up and you know, increasing equity right, in access to research that otherwise would not be uh, accessible. Would you, um, do you see this, this use case being reflected as well uh, in, in, in your experience? Uh, or do you see this side as well, or do you feel that? is skewing things towards inequality, more so than equality. Uh, very controversial. Yeah. I think the push, most of the initiative is really to improve 
the equality. And one of the initiatives I know that is um, very common here is in geomapping and heat mapping. So finding these patients who might be good trial participants or who might be interested. Um, so instead of waiting for them to come to us, we can actually deploy and come to them. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely a very big tool that AI can give us. And faster too. So faster diagnosis, faster ability to enroll them in the trials. I think from a regulatory perspective, there's been, um, I think the, you know, the agencies at the ACMS are interested in bringing the clinical trials, you know, the pragmatic clinical trials and real world evidence is maybe a little skewed because it's a huge part of what we're doing. But obviously, it impacts, I think, from a protocol perspective, it's kind of at odds, right? On one hand, you have that protocol design to show statistical significance. On the other hand, you have a real clinical practice, which often is at odds, right, with that protocol. Um, and statistical power. They are, you know, there's some, I think there is some, uh, there is, um, the Biden administration put out a document, I'm blanking on the actual name, but it was, it actually said that after the pandemic, the lessons that we've learned, we need a better infrastructure in this country to more, you know, more easily de deploy clinical trials. One such success was in the UK, where they were very rapidly able to show, for example, the efficacy of affecting dexamethasone and steroids in treatment of COVID, because they basically just roll out the protocol that they call it in the NHS, which is really difficult in England because we don't have a, we don't have a national health care system. Um, so there's there's definitely some something there that could potentially be improved, I think, um, on the on the pragmatic pragmatic front. So just to add to that, I think you uh, mentioned two different points here. One is patient burden and you know how we design the protocol and be more sensitive uh, incorporating uh, patient perspective and burden into the design of the protocol. And then and at side burden. And the second aspect is uh, around equity and access. So let's decouple these two. So regarding the first one, which is you know, patient and side problem, it's always a trade-off between clinical trials and experiment, right? Done in your life. So it's an experiment not done in lab, but uh, as an experiment, as you're designing an experiment, you want this to be as comprehensive and scientifically as rigorous as possible. But that's where the trade-off is, right? So if you want to make it too rigorous and too disciplined and too restrictive, then it's not generalizable to the population. And it adds a lot of burden during the clinical trial execution from the patient's point of view, from science point of view. But I think uh, pharmaceutical industry in general is understanding and acknowledging that. In many cases, I've seen that you know, patient friction coefficient side friction coefficient is evaluated in the protocol design phase so that we are mindful of how many assessments we are having. Uh, people used to think, you know, if you have more data, it's better because then we can do a subgroup analysis, we can identify novel biomarkers, and it will be so much scientifically that it becomes almost invisible uh, and intractable. We will generate that data. So that's one aspect, right? And the throughput starts to touch. Correct, exactly. So you have fewer and fewer and fewer eligible patients. Now, the, about the second one, right? We are in DCT for years. So uh, what we have seen is DCTs, technically it has the base advantage that if it's not side test, if it is fully decentralized, then you can be a patient from anywhere, that even from the rural areas. So, that opens up a lot of possibilities. A lot of patients certainly become eligible if, if that protocol allows us to. But it also creates certain type of bias. Maybe people who have access to the digital world will now be more eligible or more uh, in, well informed to participate in this kind of trial as opposed to the general population. So that's one type of bias. The second one is who adheres and continues to follow the protocol more diligently. 
versus not. It's one is recruitment. The second one is you know, endurance, engagement, compliance, and all these different aspects. Uh, there could be differences as well. So we ran a pretty big program uh, in ASTMA, and this is published, uh, where we have um, you know, around 200 patients who are enrolled for a period of time. Uh, and of all age groups, and we're expecting that, you know, maybe older people will be, or as I like to put it this way, the younger people are not the age savvy. So we we'll expect more adoption and adherence in terms of, and this was a decentralized part. So we we'll, were expecting more engagement from that. What came out from the data was completely honest. We saw that patients were 35 plus, actually way more adherent and compliant in this study as opposed to people who are participants who are provided them. We saw the same thing with cardiovascular patients. Yes. It's fascinating, right? So it kind of challenged our hypothesis uh, right that, that older people are not digital so. Thomas, uh, you, you touched on, on regulations. Um, what is, from a regulatory standpoint, in, in your minds, uh, what is um, hindering the development of AI in the right direction? This is recorded, but I would say <laughs> HIPAA. I think HIPAA did, uh, did that a lot. Oh, yeah, no, you know, because you have to balance patient privacy. But I think it impacted the uh, availability of electronic health records in the US. Um, and ultimately, you know, we always have to use some sort of consortia, data use agreements, and the availability of data sets for clinical research for hypothesis generation is impacted by it um, still. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my take on it. from a medical affairs standpoint, uh, where is regulation getting So for me, I think when you think regulatory, it's often anchored on predicates. And AI is something new. So it almost feels unfair to hold the AI algorithms to existing world standards. Um, you know, but this is definitely controversial. Right now we say that an AI is good if it's as good as a human. But AI is not human. So why would we limit what AI can do based on what a human can do? So I think those conversations right now are happening on whether or not we are using AI appropriately and channeling what it can do, or should we be approaching it with a different lens that we're not trying to make it human we're trying it to be more helpful for humans, not to replace humans, but to help us and make us better. And, and Bhaskar, from uh, what is your thing towards uh, digital health and digital health innovation? Um, also, we're talking about AI applications, you know, across the evidence generation life cycle and the research life cycle all the pre-study activities that can be aided by AI, uh, all the operations that can benefit from it. Um, but from a digital therapeutics or digital solution intervention, um, what is pharma industry trying uh, and what is working uh, versus what are things that we know that will work but regulation uh, is, 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 is putting a wall in front of it right now? Right. Um, so you alluded to evidence generation, right? So I think the lowest hanging fruit there is to first to create an evidence generation strategy with the help of AI. Now what I mean by that, right? Often what happens in large farm companies is you have a particular product that's launched in the market and then or got approved in the market and then a bunch of activities start happening. There is a registry. Whether there are like these four studies, whether there is DSRs, different countries are running different studies, right? So, we, where AI can help is first to 
collect all that information, structure it, and also compute the good supporting market needs are, maybe what your computers are doing, what the physicians are asking, and from that come back with where the gaps are, because that will define what additional evidence that we need to generate. Because you know, we already have the clinical data, so that itself is a strong evidence. But clinical data does not cover everything, so we have to find those right gaps first. And that's why first we get it. Then we want to design certain studies, right? So study design and there are many steps just like in, in the clinical development, like the right protocols, you have to understand in inclusion and exclusion, you know, how does that impact patient populations, where do you run this study, uh, then you have the right protocols, you have to monitor patients in, in real world, and then you have to sometimes develop novel biomarkers uh, or digital biomarkers that can help in tracking symptoms in the postpartum phase for patients which could be used to be reversing. Maybe you know, uh, this can help you monitor the disease for, and the uh, patients do not need to come to the clinic as often as they used to, right? So that can reduce the burden. We can even integrate that with you know, certain uh, new type modalities of uh, delivery of the drug. Maybe subcutaneous that patients can uh, use it at the convenience of their home as opposed to infusion, where someone has to go to the clinic. So, Putting all these things together, I think there is a huge opportunity in front of us. First, defining the evidence generation strategy, executing on those strategies, so that we can generate additional data and help in uh, changing the clinical practice in a way that helps the patients in the space. And just to add to, to what you said, all those activities is really to help for specifically for digital therapeutics to gain a reimbursement pathway. So most famously, for example, pair therapeutics, um, who did not survive because they never found a path forward for reimbursement. So they had an app for behavioral modification for opioid addiction. But for the company to be viable, they had to price their app at $1,000. And you know, how many in this room would pay $1,000 for an app? Right? So I think all this evidence generation activities is necessary, but we also need clear dialogues from the payers all over, for specifically for the U.S. that if we wanted to really spur the development of digital therapeutics, there needs to be a clear reimbursement path for it. I think that's a topic in its own right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have we're we're up on time. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, okay. So this is just in the last uh, ten seconds, uh, we're gonna open it up for for the audience to ask questions. Uh, just wanted uh, to use ten seconds just to you know thank the panelists here for for their insights and. Uh, all of this uh, resonates with what you're seeing in the market, with what uh, our clients are trying to build within the organizations, where sometimes our uh, siloed initiatives for early stage uh, uh, or later stage of drug development. Uh, and um, uh, new funding is being put together in some of the leading organizations to uh, have a uniform strategy on high, how AI is is applied uh, in discovery phase one, phase two, phase three, and, and real world, whether it is application of AI or uh, developing digital therapeutic uh, products uh, to to support patients and deliver uh, additional benefits. So, thank you so much. And uh, uh, whoever has the first question, please. Um, so I'm curious about the hospital at home, and you mentioned the reimbursement strategies. So what's what's the reimbursement strategy in this particular case? So right now we are operating on a waiver that started with the COVID pandemic. Hospital at home has been around since the 1990s, 
and then it was really during the, po the COVID period that um, Medicare was willing to reimburse at the level. I believe that this waiver is up for extension this December. So we are all waiting and seeing what is going to happen. Um, but as you can imagine, even outside government reimbursement, there is interest with the larger um, academic institutions. Kaiser, for example, is looking into it. Geisinger also. So with initiatives like Hospital at Home, we can see how it really does not operate on its own. It has to be supported by the healthcare providers, by pharma, by the payers, so that we can change how, it, how healthcare has traditionally been delivered. Thank you for the discussion. Um, you've mentioned and you've talked a little bit about you know having um, an equal access to in healthcare and also lack of diversity, um, and this would obviously reflect in our AI models because whatever data we have from the healthcare is actually biased already. Um, so, in a way, the problem is not just the AI; it's the system. So, how can we fix one versus the other, and what should be the best way forward? I can I can start maybe. I think yeah, it's a great great point. And thank you for I, I haven't said that, but you know, bias is unavoidable. It's going to be in the models regardless. Um, it's just there, right? Because it's reflected into the practice. What we have to do is, I, I think we have to start um, identifying it, and then you can work at litigation. Uh, but more often than not, you know, it's just there and it's, it isn't controlled for. Um, and ultimately, right, it, it does reflect uh, their, their methods of, of identifying it, and we, we have to be aware that it is. Uh, but yeah, ultimately, you know, there's always going to be some form of bias there. I don't know if anyone wants to follow. For me, one of the interesting insights I have from speaking with these data scientists is that data scientists always identify outliers as unnecessary or noise. So they want to take those out. Physicians, healthcare professionals, we care about those outliers and we try to bring them in back to the norm. So I think your question is, is really a, a fight between these two um, differing vantage points. But what is interesting is if we could blend them together so that the insights we get are as real as possible. Granted that there is a ton of bias, but if we only care about the outliers, we'll never be able to come up with initiatives that benefit the most. But it is a very tense fight between those two. Yeah, just to add to that conversation, I think that's definitely an extremely important discussion that we're having at pretty much different uh, uh, corners of the industry and and we have to come together to collectively uh, address this, not just the pharma industry but also regulators and etc. So we know that this is a problem, it's not just with the eye, it's a problem with clinical trials in general, right? Very small population of patients uh, participate in clinical trial and that's not representative of the general population that have the disease, the best of the world. So that what we do about it, and that gets populated in AI embedded models as well, because that's the data we have. Uh, first, we have to identify, recognize uh, that there could be biases, and what are the potential biases. Then maybe, you know, even in clinical trials, designed and going back that you know, clinical trials are experiments, right? So it's designed in a way so that you have minimum amount of confounding effects. And these compounders are basically what you're saying as outliers, right? So one way we can do this is tying it back to a consideration. Maybe you know, in the clinical trial we have generated evidence based on certain population. Is this data generalizable to a broader population? Maybe we need to do a base for study to understand what extent it's generalizable. And you know. 
we may not be studying feathers because now we have we have the effect or treatment effect that we know. So it's just whether or not it could be replicated, but we can replicate that or not. Even we can do it in, in real world setting, right? So even when the drug is in the market, we can continue to pay attention to certain populations which is not included or not correctly represented in the clinical trial. <laughs> one, one more point. One, sorry. The one key aspect of that is local validation. I think it's kind of pervasive through all the regulation is that you have to validate locally. Uh, just to maybe a strategy um, for medical affairs. How do you ensure that the AI tools that are being used are staying to the legal? Fair and balance, right? How, what's the strategy for actually making sure that the responses are staying within what is allowed by the regulation? So I guess it depends on what we are using the AI tool for, right? If we are using whatever AI tool, whether this is generative AI or not, uh, for information gathering, processing, summarizing, so that we can define our strategy internally. That's one aspect, right? So we are the consumer of this information. We take the risk in terms of whether we can trust that AI tool or not, and it's it's our decision to access. But if we are using an AI tool for systemic track using digital bottom or maybe clinical decision support, or for any other purposes, right? Or some kind of recommendation uh, for patients. So in that case, it has to go through the right kind of validation process and to get the corresponding level. So if it is a symptom tracking model based on normal digital parameters, then it has to be approved by the right regulatory path in by the FDA, whether there is a clinical device or not, etc. and depending on the risk level. Uh, and that is how, how we can get the level and could be used in, in, in practice. For us, it's many layers of review and then making sure that a certain message, for example, has been heard by all the stakeholders and we, re we repeat or we get their feedback on how this is affecting them. And I think that's what I like about um, ambient monitoring, for example, because sometimes getting that feedback is very tricky because people feel they have to say something or, you know, they're not outrightly lying. It's just they don't feel comfortable sharing that feedback. I guess the question is, is there an SMP? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, great panel and the wonderful keynote speech. Um, so my question is specifically for Dr. Dennis, um, especially regarding the AI interactor versus ROCR, um, and how can you impact significantly the difference in difference between the AI and the radiologists uh, ROC, especially when you think about the providing proposition for insurance or any sort of affairs? Great question. For details, I would refer to the paper that I cited. But in general, I would say the big challenge, as with uh, the digital therapeutics, is reimbursement. Uh, currently, even if you use AI for screening, I think it's not reimbursed, so obviously it's not going to be used. That's why, you know, human in the loop approaches. I think we are going to see especially in the development world, more um, AI in healthcare and more autonomous and with less oversight, for better or for worse. And then those tools may actually, as you know, I'm speculating, those tools may, may come back to us. I think in the US is very much limited what um, the applications, uh, especially autonomous applications of AI. In this particular case, you know, it's a good example because it shows that it's approaching or maybe even you know, surpassing the capabilities of a, of a human. And obviously to, 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 the, to the other points that were raised, 
is, uh, you know, AI is not human, and it's likely going to be better than pattern recognition at some point. But we have to be aware that there are outliers. Uh, practice, the standard of care is constantly evolving. Um, there are many different, you know, the data is multi model. The models perform very well in papers and in specific settings, but then, you know, they, they do fail to generalize. Um, so it's close, and potentially, you know, one day may surpass humans, potentially, definitely, in image recognition. Um, but still, you know, it's, uh, uh, there's a long roadway ahead. I'd like to uh, invite everyone. Fascinating, fascinating discussion. Thank you uh, to our speakers and panelists. Right? Defining, uh, forcing us to define what it means to be human. And, and, yeah, it's fascinating. So, you see uh, a few examples. Uh, our, our, speak, our panelists and speakers, uh, moderator, please stay seated. Uh, everyone else, if they'd like to come up and get in the, the group photo, we can just kind of maybe, uh, you know, circle from a half circle around uh, amongst and around our, our uh, steam panelists and uh, speakers.